Assalamualaikum friends peace be upon you today we are going to talk about a very important topic uh, <clears throat> which has uh, gained quite some controversy in in a past few months because some people have been uh, claiming a very unique and honestly a very unsubstantiated position uh, on this topic so the topic that we have today is uh, uh, Neoplatonism in 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 the Akbarian school of thought, uh, in the school of thought of uh, Sheikh Al Akbar Ibn Arabi. So the question that we will be dealing with today would be: Was Ibn Arabi a Neoplatonist or not? So obviously, the term Neoplatonist, as you know, it is not used in Islamic academia. It is not used in traditional Islamic settings. The term that we use is a uh, Hukama. And this term has been historically used for uh, Islamic philosophers. So the real question that we are asking is that whether the Akbarian school uh, agrees with the uh, the Hukama, with the Islamic philosophers, or uh, do they not? Some people have been claiming that uh, the Akbarian school is a uh, drastically different from from the positions of the Hukama, and. Uh, while the positions of the Hukama are incorrect, the position of the Aquarian school, uh, they are correct. So this is what we would be looking into today and we'll see uh, are there any differences in the Aquarian school and the Hukama and if there are, what are they and uh, can we even say that there are two distinct schools uh, different from each other in their base. And uh, is the rejection of other, does the rejection of other entail the uh, rejection of uh, Akbarian school as well, for example, or vice versa. So the first thing is, before we even go into this topic, we just want to say that uh, even if Ibn Arabi or the Akbarian school, they do not agree with Hukama, it does not uh, change anything. They have to uh, provide a source, they have to provide a, a rational argument to debunk the arguments of the Hukama. Right. So just because someone agrees with us uh, or disagree with us, that does not mean that uh, uh, that we are right or wrong. Right. To prove someone right or wrong, you have to bring your dalil. You have to bring your evidence. You have to bring your reason. You have to bring evidence substantiated by rationality. Right. So and once that evidence is provided and then the argument is established now even if ibn arabi sheikh al akbar even if he disagrees with it or even mullah sadra or ibn sina even they disagree with it we we will not agree with that opinion we will agree with the rational evidence we will agree with where the reason will take us because we say nahnu abla dalil we are uh, the uh, children we are the sons of dalil we are the sons of reason we are the sons of uh, rationality we are the sons of evidence so that is what we say. So now let us get into this topic. Was Ibn Arabi a Neoplatonist? Or I would just say, was Ibn Arabi, uh, did the Akbarian school agree with the school of Hukama? So the thing is, uh, what are the main features of uh, Islamic Neoplatonism or the school of uh, Hukama? The main features I would say is uh, one, a belief in, um, you can see it on the screen as well, that a belief in a transcendent God, right? A God that is transcendent, that is uh, above and beyond, that is not, you know, a, a part of something, right? And, uh, and that cannot be divided in any way, right? So that's for one, necessitarianism. Necessitarianism is the position that uh, everything happens through the will of God and essentially, through the will of God and there is only one world. There is only one possible world that could have existed. The third position is uh, uh, divine simplicity. That is to say that all the perfections subsist uh, within God in an absolute uh, uh, unity such that there is uh, no difference between one perfection and the other perfection except for uh, a conceptual difference. For emanationism, or fifth chain of being these are just concepts which you say you know that the first intellect was created directly by the god and then the second intellect was created or and so on and you know even universal soul and active intellect so there's a series of spiritual beings between the god and between uh, uh, this world so that's a, a series of spiritual beings that exist so the thing is that uh, 
if one supports these uh, kinds of conceptions then they can be called uh, from the school of uh, islamic philosophy they can can be co called a hakim they can be called uh, from one of the hukama or they can they can be called an islamic neoplatonist if you like using that term now to analyze whether ibn arabi and his school belongs to hukama or not we have to first know uh, who are the representative of the school of uh, ibn arabi and what we uh, what they have written about uh, this matter about this matter so let us look at the chain of the main thinkers that belong to the school of ibn arabi and then one by one we can look at their works and their conceptions about uh, uh, islamic neoplatonism and hukam and you know so obviously we have uh, ibn arabi uh 1165 to 1240 he was he is the founder of the school and uh, he has main works as such as meccan openings and fusus al hikam and then we have sadruddin kunawi 1207 to 1274 he was the stepson of uh, uh, ibn arabi and uh, he knew about a uh, uh, philosophy as well and both falsafa and irfan and he was given direct successorship of uh, ibn arabi then we have uh, of a very important figure Daud al Qaisari, 1260 to 1350. He was a student of uh, uh, Kashani, who was a student of Jandi, who was a student of Qunavi. So he is like a third generation student of Ibn Arabi and a very prolific writer. And uh, he, he was the one who uh, represented Ibn Arabi, uh, you know, as a representative of uh, Sufism in, 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 in Ottoman courts and that's why ibn arabi was adopted by ottoman turks and obviously he was adopted by mughals as well so ibn arabi was being studied from you know indonesia to northern africa to morocco so spanning over all the muslim world his, his books were absolutely fundamental and uh, then we have mullah jami 1414 to 1492 he also belongs to the Ibn school of Ibn Arabi and he extensively quotes uh, Qunavi and Hamza Fanari to, who, who are also great uh, mystics and, and, and in this line who, um, who, uh, who are great masters of the Akbarian school and uh, they say that they do believe, I would say they do believe in, in, in the philosophy of uh, Islamic Neoplatonist of, of the Hukama as well. So these are the four figures. We have many more figures in, in the Akbarian school. But today we are going to mainly focus on uh, uh, Daud al-Qasari and Mullah Jami. Why so? Because these two figures are the ones that have extensively and explicitly engaged with this issue. So, and there are two works in specific that we are going to uh, focus on. And the reason I bring evidence from these works is because these works are also available in English. So if anyone uh, wants to find these works, I, I would pin the link into the description and you can read these works for your own self. So that you, you, you do not have to believe me. Maybe some people cannot read Arabic, otherwise we would have bring, brought forward evidence from uh, Qunavi as well, right? Because to understand Ibn Arabi, you need to understand his commentators. Because Ibn Arabi is writing in a specific kind of language, which is not the language, the semantic system is not uh, identical to the one used by Hukama, but the ideas are the same. So these ideas then are ten, then taken, put into a semantic system of Hukama by the later thinkers, by by his uh, steps and Qunavi, or uh, by by other people. So. The thing is that uh, we have to understand how these commentators are understanding their own shaykh that they have a direct line to that, that they have direct ijazah from. Now, that's why I have chosen Mullah Jami and Dawud al-Qaisri to be the representative of Akbarian school. And then we can analyze their translated works as well. So anyone can read them and reach their own uh, conclusion. Obviously, there are far more, many works there. There, there are far, many thinkers as well. Kash, there's Kashani, there's Kunavi, there's, uh, you know, uh, many other thinkers, uh, which we can read if, if we are to read in Persian and Arabic, but these are the sources that we have in English. So let us get into the sources and let's see, uh, what, what is being uh, brought forward and what are these, uh, uh, thinkers saying. So let us first go to Qaisari because Qaisari comes before Mullah Jami. So Qaisari has this, uh, muqaddimah on Fusus al Hikam, right? He writes a shara, a very famous shara, uh, in defense of uh, 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 Ibn Arabi as well. And in this shara, he uh, writes a muqaddimah. That that muqaddimah itself is a, is a widely uh, known 
celebrated and it's a fundamental text in uh, uh, in Ibn Arabi commentaries. It's a very authentic and reliable text to understand the view of uh, Ibn Arabi to and un understand the view of Sufia. So in this text, uh, which is the Muqaddimah al Qaisariya as well, uh, Qaisari writes uh, many things which which explicitly uh, support the opinion of the philosopher. So let us get straight into it. So the very first thing that we are going to see from uh, uh, Qaisari is on divine simplicity, right? So here you can see uh, Qaisari writes, uh, and this this muqadma has been translated by Mukhtar Ali as well, and I will pin a link into the description to the whole muqadma, so you do not have to do any worry that there is a parallel translation to this muqadma, and you can easily read it. So he says that, and the divine simplicity is that all the attributes are God are identical to each other. So he says that. If you know this, then you will know what is meant by his attributes are identical with his essence. So if I to a glimmer of its reality will appear to you. Its meaning will be seen to be what has been mentioned and not what the mind conjunctures uh, in saying that life, knowledge and power emanate from him and are concomitant with him and are identical with his essence. See, they are all identical with his essence. They are all one in his essence. You can absolutely read it. This is this is the level of uh, 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 Wahadiyya. There's the level of Ahadiyya. Uh, there's, you know, all attributes are one in him. So this is what uh, Ibn, uh, well, well, what Qaisari is mentioning. This is the same view of uh, 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 Islamic philosophers as well. That Sifatu uh, Nazati, uh, that uh, the uh, attributes of God are identical to his essence. That is exactly what we say as well. The next uh, uh, thing that we say is, you know, that uh, Universe is eternal. The philosophers say that the universe is eternal. Now let us see what uh, Qaisari has to say about it. In the page 78-79 of the Muqaddimah, he writes, I, I, I won't read in Arabic, but uh, know that the names of the acts are subdivided in accordance with their uh, governing properties. Those are some names whose governance is never discontinued, whose effects are infinite and pre-eternally and post-eternally, such as the names governing the Holy Spirits, angelic souls and everything, that although originated is not governed by time, zaman, but an eternal time, dahar. So you see, uh, Ibn Qaisari is clearly, very clearly saying that uh, the effects whose effects are infinite pre-eternally and post-eternally so these these effects all of these names they are infinite post-eternally and pre-eternally so uh, according to kunavi the divine realms or 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 the chain of being just such as you know holy spirit the angelic souls you know the first intellect and so on these okul uh, all the intellects they are eternal they are eternal and this is the exact thing that we believe in and this, this, this is why many people say you know call us heretic because in their belief uh, as Ghazali has written in Hafat al Philosophy, that Hudus, Hudus cannot be without temporal origination that if something is eternal it cannot be created but obviously for Ibn Arabi as you can see for Qaisari he is clearly saying that something eternal can be created at the same time and it would have hudus e dohri which, which is the same concept that Ma'allim uh, al uh, use as well uh, so that is absolutely clear that uh, Qaisari believes that uh, the divine, uh, the, the realms, the higher realms uh, are eternal. So the intellects are eternal and the Thinasulat are eternal. He clearly believes in this. So the next uh, thing that we are going to look, yeah, the next thing we are going to look is uh, Qaisari's view on necessitarianism. So the necessitarianism is that there is only one possible world and every cause is necessitated by its effects. So Qaisari says in, in the Muqaddimah that it was mentioned in the discussion of the archetypes that the necessity encompasses all external and intellectual entities since a thing whose existence is not necessitated 
does not come into being either externally or in in the intellect thus necessity can be subdivided into necessity in itself wa wujub bi dhat wa ila wujub bil ghair and necessity through another know that this division is only with respect to division between lordship and servitude however with respect to absolute oneness there is no necessity through something else but only through essence anyway everything that is necessary by something else is contingent in essence the contingency has also encompassed it the reason for its being described by contingency is to distinguish it were it not for this distinction existence would be equivalent to his essential necessity so what he is saying that there are two types of necessity everything is necessary right everything is necessary he is saying this in the first paragraph that uh is uh, because necessity encompasses all external and intellectual entities right so everything in is necessary the only difference is that some things are necessary through another and some things are necessary in itself that is called wujub bil dhat and wujub bil ghair right and this is exactly the view of ibn sina these are exactly the terms that are used by ibn sina to describe his necessitarianism and interestingly these are the same terms that are used even by spinoza to explain his necessitarianism so this this definitely proves that uh, qaisari and and the akbarian school uh, is is necessitarian is is explicitly necessitarian and this is exactly what they are saying here that uh, something is either ex internally necessary or externally necessary if it is externally necessary then it is contingent in its own self right it exists within its own self through its own uh, it, it, it exists through another and it can, it does not exist within itself and through its own self it only exists through another and it is only necessitated through another that is wujub bil ghair necessary through another and necessary in itself wujub bil zat that only belongs to god because nothing else is, has wujub bil zat nothing else is necessary in itself nothing else substantiates its own self so this explicitly shows that uh, qaisari believes in necessitarianism as well now we should go on to emanationism um this is explicitly clear uh, like there's no one reference for it even ibn arabi you can you can find it extensively in all the akbarian school i say, i think this is not even a question as to whether ibn arabi or uh, the akbarian school even believed in uh, emanationism or not it's obviously clear that they believed in emanationism but uh, to just read one reference uh, qaisari says that unwilling processes degrees in accordance with the removal of veils either in the in entirety or the removal of some veils over others thus one witnesses the permanent archetypes on the plane of divine knowledge possesses the highest station of all thereafter one who witnesses them in the first intellect and others among uh, others from the intellects then uh, then the one who witnesses them in the guarded tablet and the remaining immaterial souls then in the book of the effectment and the establishment then he witnesses them in the remaining sublime spirits and divine books from among the throne and the pedestal and the heavens and the elements and, and the compounds since one of these degrees is a divine book that subsumes in entities and realities below it the highest degree is that of hearing namely hearing speech of god without any intermediary such as our prophet's hearing peace and blessings be upon him in his ascension miraj and the times he referred into to it in his saying that i have a time with god that neither an angel brought nigh nor a prophet sent out embraces me right and prophet musa hearing the speech of almighty so and then you can read the uh, then hearing his speech by means of jibril upon him such as hearing the noble quran then hearing the speech of the first intellect and the other intellects then hearing the speech of the universal soul the celestial and the earthly angels and the rest accordingly so obviously he is describing this whole hierarchy of being and how you know you go from god to the first intellect you know through the guarded tablet to the immaterial soul to the universal soul to the celestial and earthly angels so there is this whole uh, chain of being to a whole chain of emanation that qaisari is uh, explaining so this this cannot even be questioned so this is absolutely clear that qaisari believes in in a, in a, in a universal soul in a, in a first intellect and in this whole chain of being so now let us come to mulla jami 
the interesting thing about mullah jami is that he wrote a complete book on this actually and the, this book is called uh, called the al faqira and in the precious pearl and in this book he clears the matter extensively and one can trust qaisari and mullah jami because these people have uh, ijazat these people have a direct relation uh, with with the aquarian tradition and know how to interpret it in arabic and to, are far more worthy of interpreting ibn arabi than any of us right so now if we are to look at mullah jami i will present the arabic as well as the english so uh, if we are to see first of all mullah jami affirming divine simplicity so mullah jami says that as for the sufis they took the position that god's attributes were identical with his essence with respect to existence bi hasab al wujud but other than it with respect to intellection taqul right uh, so they are different with respect to taqul and they are same with respect to existence and this is exactly our position that there is a conceptual existence there this is the position of avicenna as well as well as mullah sadra that there is a conceptual existence in regards to essence so uh, essence and uh, you know the attributes such that they are conceptually distinct with respect to taqul bi hasab hasab taqul they are different right but with respect to existence with respect to ontology with respect to reality they they are identical to each other and this is exactly what mullah jami singh the interesting thing is he even quotes uh, uh, sheikh al akbar al muhyiddin ibn arabi and says a very harsh thing he says some denied his attributes although the intuition of the prophets and the saints testifies to the contrary that he is talking about mu'tazila other affirmed them and judged them to be completely different from his essence such as asharites this is complete unbelief kufr is the word kufr and pure polytheism so he says uh, he quotes ibn arabi as saying that anyone who believes that the attributes are really distinct or additional to the essence they are doing pure kufr and this is absolute absolute polytheism this is this is pure shirk so as you can see the, the not only is he accepting divine simplicity but he is saying anyone who denies divine simplicity uh, they they must be questioned actually and then that is pure kufr so that that is a very strong thing that he says actually so now uh, let's see what jami is saying about uh, affirming the uh, affirming the eternity of the uh, first effect so he says that uh, as for the sufis may god uh, sanctify their soul they allowed the dependence of an eternal effect on a free agent and combined affirmation of a agent's free choice with the belief in the existence of an eternal effect they said clear mystical revelation has shown that if a thing necessitates an entity through its essence rather than through a condition superseded to its essence which is what we call other or if that thing includes one or more conditions which are identical with its essence such as relations and attributes then it continue, uh, continues necessitating that entity and dues it with as long as its essence induces as for example the most exalted pen al qalam al a'la for it were the first thing created and there being no intermediary wasita between it and the creator and it endures as long as the creator endures so is explicitly and very clearly saying that the first intellect the qalam that is eternal right and they allow for something to be eternal right and still be created and this is the position of hukama this this is the position for which hukama were called kafirs right and this is the same position that mullah jami is taking is the akbarian school is taking they are not taking the asharite definition or the maturidi definition in which a thing has to be preceded by temporal uh, lack of existence you know by temporal non existence to be called a creation to be called an effect so that is absolutely clear that mullah jami is accepting the position of the philosopher on this matter uh the next thing that we can go on to is to show mullah jami affirming uh the rule of one so mullah jami in in this he says you know rule of one is that al wahid la yasdur anhu illa wahid that the 
واحد the one does not uh, give anything except the one uh, and he says on uh, on in the 79th on page 67 that thus the sufis agree with the philosophers on the impossibility of the emanation of multiplicity from what is really one al wahid haqiqi right and he also says you know that uh, however with respect to it is apparent he says it is apparent that the true true position is that of philosophers namely that it it is impossible for multiplicity to emanate from what is really one for this reason the verifying sufis agreed with the philosophers on this point right they differed on them however with respect to first principles being really one for as has been said they form his, uh, for him attributes and relations which differ from him in the mind so th there's a small difference as well so or or as mulla jami at least perceives it that he says the sufis also think of the relations with the first essence uh, first intellect when saying that the first intellect whether is it really one or not right but he affirms the rule of one and he says the first intellect is one and direct multiplicity asharite conception of god uh, and and god causing absolute you know multiplicity directly from him is absolutely false this is what uh, mulla jami makes absolutely clear in if if you read before him it as well so this shows that yes there are small differences and by here the philosophers they mean mashayyun so there are small differences which uh, the uh, the sufia as qaisari and uh, mullah jami understand it have with the uh, peripatetic philosophers such as avicenna and his school and uh, later on mullah sadra even mullah sadra has these differences right so these differences do not make you out of the fold the general scheme of islamic philosophers because if that is the case then even sohra wardi is not an islamic philosopher or mullah sadra is not an islamic philosopher so there are small differences here and there but the general scheme the general things that i told you necessitarianism you know emanationism rule of one you know all these things they agree they agree with each other right the eternity of the universe the eternity of the material and immaterial realms they all agree with it right so it is absolutely clear that uh, ibn arabi and his school uh, was absolutely neoplatonist right had it had they even not been neoplatonist it would not have affected the position of hukama in any way because we accept the leel right we do not accept uh, uh, anything else but it is absolutely clear being the great school that they are a school that has been taught as as the height in famous and most famous uh, islamic seminaries sunni seminaries and one which has to be the mainstream most famous and dominant form of islam from indonesia to north africa right one has to agree that this this has been the dominant islamic theology classical theism has been the dominant islamic theology uh, the position of the hukama has been uh, uh, dominant islamic theology so now if these people disagree with us right or if they think that they we are wrong they have to bring some evidence right otherwise they are uh, they uh, i believe that they are uh, they they do not know anything about the islamic tradition and they just think that we are a minority and that we are wrong and that we have we are heretics but that is not the case as you can clearly see this has been believed by so many great intellectuals of the islamic world right and to say that uh, and to make this distinction between islamic philosophers and uh, ibn arabi is absolutely wrong the system of the ibn arabi and islamic philosophers is identical to each other with obviously there are some small differences mullah sadra comes up later and you know talks about these differences and uh, merges them and take some positions and this is an ongoing process as we uh, people have different positions on different issues but overall the scheme of uh, ibn arabi the akbarian school is identical to the scheme of uh, uh, ibn sina to the scheme of mullah sadra to the scheme of sheikh ul ishraq sahra wardi to the scheme of uh, ikhwan safa so i think now uh, whenever you will uh, see any such person making claim that ibn arabi is distinct from uh, uh, islamic philosophers or he has uh, somehow refuted islamic philosophers in any way or is the god of islamic philosophers is static in some way and and the, which is absolutely ridiculous and god of ibn arabi is somehow more present 
that is absolutely wrong and i think if if you are a, a sincere learner of islamic philosophy you should always call out such a person and make it clear that this is not the case they are merely representing misrepresenting uh, the thought of ibn arabi and they are misconstructing it according to their own notions and according to their own beliefs and according to their own desires so, and we are not going to accept it if someone wants to do our takfir they have to do takfir of ibn arabi as well and they have to do takfir of everyone who called called him shaykh al akbar so i hope you liked this video thank you very much ma'as salama jazakallah